Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to this installment of our CRM Blueprint series. This edition is covering sales and marketing alignment, and our title for today is Stop Passing the Baton and Start Rowing the Boat. Now, we're excited about this specific time to talk about sales and marketing alignment because, as you probably already know, Sugar CRM and Sales Fusion, a leading marketing automation provider, have merged. So that's why we have our speakers for today being myself. Uh, and just let me introduce myself really quickly. I'm Martin Schneider. I'm the CRM product expert at Sugar CRM. And I've got Jenna Ferguson with me, who's the director of professional services at Sales Fusion, now Sugar CRM. So we're really excited uh, to be with you today. And Jenna's going to be presenting most of the content today, really bringing the, the marketing automation side and what that brings to CRM and sales automation and talking about, you know, being that glue to really create a really aligned funnel. So let's talk a bit more about the agenda and what we want to go through today. So we've already done our introductions. We're going to talk about the reality of sales and marketing alignment today uh, in, in a bit of a humorous way. We're going to talk about fixing that disconnected funnel that most of you are probably experiencing now in some form or another. Uh, talk about defining processes and, and really getting started along this process of creating a really well-aligned sales and marketing machine. Talk about some supporting technologies uh, if we have time and then some Q&A uh, from you guys. Now, remember, you're all in listen-only mode. If you have a question, you'll see the little questions tab on the console bar there. Just type that in. I'll be moderating the Q&A at the end. We'll get to your questions then. If I don't get to your question, if we run out of time, don't worry. I will respond to those with an email afterwards. Great. So with that, Jenna, why don't you take it from there? Awesome. Thank you, Martin. Um, so thank you, everybody, for attending today. Um, I'm excited to be here and kind of go through um, some good information on sales and marketing alignment, a lot of things that we see um, from the marketing automation side and how that can help kind of drive alignment between teams. So we're going to start off with the age old adage. Um, so a few stereotypes in here, no one get their feelings hurt. Um, so what sales says, like, uh, yeah, if um, you could get some more leads, that'd be great. Um, so they're always searching for those leads, right? They're wondering what's marketing doing? Why don't they have leads raining from the sky upon me? Um, on a daily basis, right? And then you have marketing on the other side um, of the equation. They're working their tails off, trying to generate um, new leads coming into the funnel, getting people qualified up, getting out um, the message around who you are and what you do, um, and then passing those over to the sales team, right? And so they're wondering, you know, why isn't sales happy with the leads that we're sending? And so this is a little bit of a stereotype sometimes, but it can be a little bit of a reality as well. Um, and it's not that either team isn't doing what they should be or um, isn't trying to their best of their ability. It's that they're not aligned in what they're working towards together, right? So we'll talk a little bit about the reality of sales and marketing alignment. Um, so the graphic that you see here is um, the results of a study we did a few years back um, with sales and marketing teams, and they were asked to um, essentially rate their current communication between the two teams within their company. So are they fully aligned, are they somewhat aligned, or are they on two completely different planets, essentially? Um, and so what we found out was that for the vast majority of companies, there's pretty significant room for improvement in aligning the two teams together. Um, so what you're looking at here the four different bars um, represent people who have um, their marketing automation tool integrated with their CRM um, that have service level agreements in place between sales and marketing. So basically they sat down together, said, here's our process. We've defined out what it is that um, marketing is responsible for, what it is that sales is responsible for, and how the two teams are going to work together. Um, and everyone is on the same page in terms of what it is that's required from each each side of the house. Um, so to no one's surprise, the people who have had that conversation and have those agreements in place and also have integrated technologies rated their communication as being pretty pretty good. So that's that, that 57% um, in the green there. The next line down is folks who um, do not have integrated systems but still have that process in place. The third line 
is an integrated system, but do not have a process in place, and then the bottom line is people who have neither. So kind of to no one's surprise, the people who have both disconnected tools and disconnected processes have um, the most room for um, improvement in terms of aligning those two teams and feeling like they are communicating with one another. So um, I think what this really underscores is that it's not the technology that drives that conversation, it's the process. Um, and so having that communication between the two teams really is um, critically important. Um, so just to kind of underscore that a bit more um, and reiterate that importance, of having the tightly aligned sales and marketing teams um, is this quote from Marketing Cross. Um, so essentially, those who are aligned have, um, they enjoy 38% higher win rates and 36% higher customer retention rates um, when they do have those, that alignment between the two teams. So I think that really hits home on kind of how important it is for everyone to be working together um, and, and really driving that process forward. So, that you're able to get the most out of the efforts that each team is doing. So now we're going to talk a little bit about kind of yesterday versus today. So what is the traditional process look like between the two teams and then what can it look like today? So traditionally, um, everyone kind of thinks of it as passing the baton. So this is where our, our title for today's webinar comes in. So traditionally, there's this handoff to sales. So marketing is sourcing the leads, they're nurturing them, they're qualifying them to a certain extent, and then they're passing that off to the sales team kind of like you would in a relay race, right? They're handing that, that lead over. From there, sales is going to qualify that some more. They're going to sell that value, negotiate any terms of the agreement, anything like that, and they're going to win that customer. So that's kind of the traditional way of looking at it. There is a challenge to that, though. So not all leads are going to be active buyers. So marketing may source a particular lead to a per certain point. They think, hey, this is a great lead. They hand it off. But maybe that person is not ready to buy at this particular moment. Um, maybe their timeline is a bit further out. And so sales has this tendency to kind of focus on the near term and those that are truly qualified and are going to close quickly um, because that's their goal. And so basically, if those leads don't have that immediate need and that immediate interest, that baton can get dropped and those leads can get neglected because sales is turning their attention to the ones that have a more near-term close date. So what this can lead to, essentially, is what we call the disconnected funnel. So if you think of your funnel, up at the top, you have your new leads coming in, or I guess in this case, it would be to the left. Um, we turned it on its side a little bit. So you have your leads coming in, and that's marketing focus. They're generating that interest at the top of the funnel. They're getting new leads coming in. They're nurturing them up to a certain point. So they're driving that towards that interest and desire um, that we see in the middle. And then as that lead passes over, they're going to go to sales. Sales is going to eventually convert them to a customer. They make the, the, the deal. And then hopefully we're retaining those folks as customers moving forward into the future. Um, but what can happen is those, those ones in the middle, so the ones that uh, marketing qualifies up, they come over, and maybe right now is not the time, or um, they don't have budget at the moment. Whatever the reason may be, there could be a whole host of reasons why someone may not be ready at any given time. Um, and so what can happen is those warm leads, so, so they're qualified to a point. They're not just you know gone and, and disqualified. They were warmed up, it's just they weren't ready to make it over the finish line quite yet. And so what can happen is those warm leads leak out. And so when there's not a process in place and there's not technology in place to help recycle those, they're just going to fall out of the funnel and then marketing is going to have to spend additional time and effort and potentially even money to recapture those lost leads later on. So that's what can happen um, with that disconnected process. So then what does it look like today? Um, so this is where we get into more of an aligned approach. So the way we're positioning this one is you're all in the same boat rowing together. So rather than it being a relay race where you're passing off the baton to someone else, you as a sales and marketing team are working together in alignment in the same boat rowing together. Um, so basically you're able to expend the same amount of energy um, but get more revenue and get more results from the efforts that you're, you're um, expending. And so that's gonna ensure that um, as leads come through, 
um, and they're getting the right engagement, they're hitting the right person at the right time, um, and that they're not getting lost. Um, and so if you think about how uh, a lead would move through the sales cycle, um, marketing is nurturing those leads up to a point. They're building that brand awareness. That would eventually go to sales. So you have someone kind of like an SDR or a BDR who's building that awareness and qualifying that lead even more. That might then go to an account exec who's going to then vet that out, potentially create opportunities, convert those to customers, and then have that customer engagement as well. So then this is going to be what your connected funnel looks like. So rather than someone coming in at the top and potentially leaking out partway through, those folks who are warm leads, but they're just not quite ready to make it over the finish line to, um, to become a customer, they can get recycled back to the top of the funnel. So this is where that alignment and everyone following the process and then having the technology in place to make it happen can get those leads back to the top of the funnel and they can continue through that nurturing cycle until they are ready to buy. So that way they're not just lost altogether and having to be recaptured later on. They're still in the process. They're just continuing um, in a little bit different path than they would originally. Um, so uh, in terms of defining the process, um, that is something that is, to be honest, the hard part. Um, and something that I always talk about a lot with our customers is that the technology is not the thing that will create the process. You create the process and the technology supports it. Um, so a lot of times people will purchase a particular tool thinking this is going to solve my problems. And really it will help alleviate some of your problems, but you have to kind of tackle it head on, figure out what the process is, and then orchestrate the tools together to make that process work. So in terms of that, where does it start? How do you start having this conversation to drive alignment between the two teams? Um, and it really does start with leadership. So having someone at the top who's driving this process um, and kind of advancing the conversation forward is really critical. Um, so just start with a meeting. It's really simple. Involve the leadership from both sales and marketing. Map out that plan together. It will not be the perfect plan, uh, a square one. Um, and even teams who feel like they are really well aligned can always be more aligned. There's always more that you can do to help make sure that everyone's on the same page. So the kind of flip side of that coin is that you also have to recognize the current state of misalignment. So it's, it's kind of peeling back the layers, doing a little self-reflection, um, and knowing that there's always room for improvement. So, you know, Dig deep, look in any and all ways that you can be working together as one team instead of these siloed individual departments um, that are kind of doing their own thing. Because when you have that happening, it's very difficult for the technology to support the process. Because even if you put, um, you know, you have integrated platforms that are pushing and pulling information back and forth between them, if no one is dispositioning a lead correctly on the sales side or marketing, um, system isn't set up to listen or, or look for that change, then the process is broken, right? So um, it really does take everyone working together to make it work. Uh, and so what we uh, talk a lot about with folks um, is writing out those processes. And so what can be a really interesting exercise is to basically go through separately um, so have marketing do it individually, have sales do it individually, um, and go through what that pro what they see that process is. So what is a marketing qualified lead? What activities are important for someone to have engaged in before they come over to sales? You know, what is it that um, we're all looking for? Um, what are those goals and what are the strategies to achieve them? And it can be really interesting to see how different those are when you then come back together. Um, so have everyone write everything down separately. Um, so high-level goals, operational strategies of how you're actually going to, um, to make this work. Um, swap those documents. Have everyone look at what everyone else is thinking. And then go through them together. So that way you can take pieces from each and build out your actual process together. Because the perspective that sales has um, as they work a lead is going to be very different than what marketing may be thinking. 
that they're they're looking for. And so really putting those pieces together and working through it as a team is a really good exercise to go through. And then once that process is clearly written out, everyone's in full agreement as to what the plan is um, behind the strategy. Don't just stick it in a drawer and never look at it again. You want to really create um, an agreement. And so, uh, you know, even as, as specific as, you know, once the lead comes over within X amount of time, sales will somehow disposition this record or, and either send it back to marketing or move it into um, a more qualified sales stage. And so even those different agreements, one to the other, and then once sales does push it back, how long before marketing is going to pick that up and put it back into a nurture? Um, does that happen automatically? Is there a time limit? You know, all of those agreements are things that, that you can go through together, and it's kind of a no stone unturned approach. The more detailed you are, the better off you're going to be. And you want to review those and update those on a con continuous basis. Because um, what can happen is the ideal customer today may not be the ideal customer six months from now. The, the programs that you're running today may not work for your goals and your company initiatives a year from now. So you don't want to just say, oh, well, this is the process and it is what it is, it can always be modified and you can always go back and make changes to it. Um, you just want to do that together. Um, it is very likely, like I said, you won't get it perfect on the first try. Um, and so just keep looking back, working together, and then make updates and tweaks as needed because things are going to change. Um, it's all just part of the process. So then in terms of supporting technologies, um, I hit on this a ton. Um, having an integrated sales um, and marketing tool is really important to help drive this process forward. Um, because what's really great is that the technology can support that and can automate a lot of those processes. So if sales' role is to um, change that lead status to remarket every time they talk to someone who isn't ready to buy right now, if they're doing that, then the technology can pick up on that change, add them automatically to a nurture campaign, and it all happens seamlessly without anyone else having to touch it. And so it, it does take a lot of preparation to know, okay, what content do we want them to receive? Here's the circumstance in which you would apply that status. Um, there's a lot that has to go into actually setting that up, but then once you have that, that's when it, the automation really takes over and it can really benefit everyone because they're not having to pass lists of people back and forth and have marketing do this manual piece and sales do this manual piece. The systems are taking care of it for, for you. Um, so essentially, now that you have your process laid out, both teams are in agreement. You put that technology in place, and that's going to enable that strategy that you've worked out together. Um, so in terms of core technologies, you have your CRM tool. You have your marketing automation tool. And really, having the integration between the two is so critical to driving that forward. So kind of some of the advantages that go along with that um, is automatically pushing to lead, pushing leads to CRM and assigning those to sales at the right time. So that might be through a mechanism like lead scoring. So if I have a lead scoring profile that's looking at engagement across all of my leads, they hit a particular threshold, I want to automatically push that lead into CRM for sales to work um, and continue that process forward. Um, so having that automatic push instead of having to pull all of those together manually can be really um, uh, important. And then syncing all the activities between the two systems so that sales is able to see what engagement that, that person has had. I mean, how much more valuable of a conversation are you going to have if you know every page of the website this person has looked at, every email they've opened, what content they're interested in, what product they're interested in, um, and be able to drive that conversation towards what you already know about them rather than just reaching out and kind of blindly guessing at what it is they might be wanting to talk about. Um, and then just helping prioritize that outreach um, in terms of efficiency. So if you have something like lead scoring, you have the last time they were active and looked at something or opened an email, um, and you're able to prioritize that. Um, the more quickly you follow up with someone after they've engaged, the more likely they are to, to have that conversation with sales. And so knowing that um, and knowing what they've looked at, sales can really prioritize that outreach so they are contacting the people who are call it the hottest first um, as they work their way through that, that process. Um, 
So, you know, having that full, full visibility um, into the, the digital footprint is really critical. Um, giving sales influence over the buyer's journey. So, what it, a, a lot of times people don't think about is the, the handoff back to marketing. Um, and so, even just from within CRM, they're able to trigger those changes and have that pick back up on the marketing side. Um, and then you can also um, look at that from a reporting perspective as well. So, um, you know, from in terms of analysis, marketing is probably spending a lot of time and effort and, and most likely money as well um, to qualify leads up to that point. And so being able to, to close that loop and see, okay, well, these are, these are the opportunities that we won. What are the steps that they took to get there? Um, that's really critical because um, then you can start to replicate those patterns over time um, if you're able to gain that insight into how people um, ultimately ended up. So whether it went to close one, close loss, remarket, you're able to see how that, um, that was influenced. So then to kind of take that a step further, um, we have essentially an example pipeline here. So this is looking at um, different uh, sections of the, the sales, different phases of the sales cycle, um, where that information would live, and then how that could kind of convert to either um, lead scoring or um, lead stages within CRM. So um, this is just kind of an example. You can define these groups of people um, in terms of nomenclature, however makes sense for you. Um, the way we've done it here, um, so I'll try and highlight with my mouse here. So this first category we're calling records. These are basically just people with an email address that exist in SalesFusion. So this example is using uh, the, the integration between uh, Sales Fusion and Sugar CRM. So to us, a record would just be an email address that exists within Sales Fusion. So maybe this is someone who um, came in through a web form submission. It could be someone's sales source. You got a list of folks you met at a trade show. They're basically just someone in Sales Fusion. And they have a score of zero. So they're just in the system waiting to be marketed to. And then the next stage up from that is going to be inquiries. So these are people that um, have taken some sort of action to score at least one point on our scoring profile. So that might be a web hit, um, it might be an email opener click, form submission, could be anything. Um, but it's something valuable enough for us to assign it a lead score. Um, and so we're going to set that threshold at 1 to 74. When it comes to lead scoring, and I could go off on a huge tangent about lead scoring, but I will resist for today. Um, the numbers when it comes to scoring really are arbitrary. What matters is that they are in proportion to the weight of what that action is. Um, so something like a form submission where people are giving you information about themselves, that's gonna be more valuable than just a web hit where they're clicking around. So you can assign those types of things more points. Um, we typically set a cut score at like 75, some people like 100 because they like real numbers. It really doesn't matter. Um, you could do it at 10 if you wanted to, if it is what you need. Um, so we're going to have those inquiries. So those are basically just folks in Sales Fusion who are active. They've done something to be scored. They're continuing to be nurtured. They're continuing to be marketed to. We're just waiting for them to engage at, up to that 75 uh, cut score. So then once someone does hit 75 points, we're going to consider them a marketing qualified lead. So they've reached that threshold to say this person is worthy enough, they've done enough for sales to actually talk to them and engage with a human. So um, at that point, we're going to push that lead automatically into Sugar CRM. It's going to enter there. It'll get routed to the correct person. Um, they'll start following up and working the sales process on the CRM side. Um, so if that person um, the SDR reaches out, they have that discovery call with them, they determine, yes, this person is a sales qualified lead, they're going to disposition them um, within Sugar CRM, say, yes, this is a sales qualified lead, mark that lead stage as discovery. You could key off of that lead stage within Sales Fusion. So you could say, anytime I have a lead whose stage equals discovery, I want them removed from this previous nurture campaign and put into a different one, or I want them to kind of be put on hold and not sent to you um, currently. So there's different things that you 
um, can do with that. And then if it continues through the sales process, qualified lead converts to an opportunity. That's again, still living in sugar. We will sink opportunities down. So marketing is able to see on the sales fusion side that, hey, there's a there's a uh, opportunity open for this particular lead that we pushed over last week or something like that. Um, so they might be a prospective, prospective customer. And then once that deal does actually close and they become a customer, we could change their status to um, current customer. And then we know, hey, we should be talking to them as a customer, not as a prospect. Um, so that's just kind of a good example of um, different ways that you can move folks through. Again, this is something you want to define together. So having sales and marketing determine what is that cut score? What are the actions? How many actions do they need to take before they get to that point? These are all things that you would talk through as you work through that process and then set the system up to support that. Um, so that can be a really interesting way to kind of look at it. So hopefully that example was helpful. Um, so then questions. Um, with that, I'll, I'll open it up to Martin to see if any questions have come in through the, the chat. Yes, we have we have uh, we have a few questions uh, that we'll try to get through uh, pretty quickly. Thanks uh, for all those. And if you do uh, have a question now, please uh, write it in. If we don't have time for it, we will send it to you your answer by email. Real quick one: uh, What does SDR stand for? <laughs> oh, good question. Um, so an SDR is a sales development rep. So um, this could be someone on your sales team who is in charge of having that initial discovery conversation. Um, some companies have them, some don't, some call them different things. Um, so you might hear business development rep, um, sales development rep. It's, it's typically that kind of first line on the sales team to see if um, a lead is actually qualified. Great. Okay. Okay, a few more here. Uh, this one's interesting. I think it goes back to when you're talking about uh, – kind of getting getting the meeting and putting people together. Uh, it says, who do you suggest we focus on as champions? A lot of times sales leadership is really busy closing deals to be part of an integration project. Is there any kind of back doors that you can uh, think about in terms of getting uh, sales and marketing aligned if the VP of sales is, is hard to uh, uh, get committed? <laughs> Yeah, I, that is that's a very fair question. Sometimes it can be hard to have that conversation start at the top. I would say try and get um, sort of the most senior person you can, right? Because they typically have more power and sway over the organization. Um, but even if, so say you're kind of that that just like average, you know, marketing manager or sales rep, um, and you see real value in this, find your counterpart on the other team. Um, and start working, start having that conversation amongst yourselves. And then as a united front, you can move that up the ladder. So typically to make pretty broad changes within an organization, because if you think about um, creating this process, it's a, probably a pretty significant change to what you may currently be doing, um, especially if those two teams don't typically work mm -hmm. together. Uh, and so I would say you know, create a united front get the buy-in with your counterpart, and then have sort of a, a general action plan, start that process, and then work that out so that um, you already have some, some good information and some good um, collaboration before you present that to your, your higher up. That's great. And just to add to that, one of the things we've seen, uh, even in our own organization, because we use uh, CRM and marketing automation uh, integrated as well, is, is either revenue or sales operations sometimes has, a, has that power because they're the ones using the software uh, as well and, and really looking at some of the reporting. So so uh, another, another department to look at as well. Uh, another question, uh, Jenna, is uh, I think we kind of talked through this, but I, I wanted to make sure we're totally clear. Uh, S is, can we define our own lead stages? Because I think some of the score, you were pointing out that the scoring can be whatever it can be. Uh, and does Sales Fusion make it easy for us to create those different buckets? Absolutely. Um, so I'll just kind of slide back over to that slide real quick. What you call these is completely up to you. So just like the scores are as you define them, so are your lead stages. The really critical piece of that is making sure that everyone understands what they mean. Um, so if I say my lead stage is discovery, what does that actually mean? So who's responsible mm -hmm. for that stage? What activities are tied to someone being in that stage? And what does someone in that stage look like um, in terms of like the lead? And so 
as long as everyone is on the same page in terms of understanding what those mean, you can completely define them as you want. Typically, that's something you're going to define on the CRM side, and we will sync that over. So if you have, you know, discovery, um, remarket, whatever your different stages may be, and it's, you, it's usually going to be a pick list um, within mm -hmm. CRM, we'll pull that down, and then you would have those same ones on our side to be able to reflect that. Um, so definitely you can define those yourself. That's great. Uh, another question for you, Jenna, is... Do you, uh, and I, I think, you know, we've seen people do this a lot when they're look, working with something a little less sophisticated than Sales Fusion uh, out, of, out of either necessity or simplicity. But uh, do you recommend having a single action that can push a lead into sugar or should there always be multiple actions needed to score high enough, I guess, for conversion? I'll, I'll finish the grammar there. But uh, I, I, we used to call them kind of the, um, you know, the trump card kind of thing, but is there, do you recommend that or is that maybe dependent on the business? What, what's yeah, your thoughts there, on that? There can be a lot of variables that go into that. Um, usually for most people, there is that sort of like trump card action. So like for us, if you fill out a demo request, we don't care what else you've done. Like we're still going to call you <laughs> and we're going to give yeah. you a demo. Um, but um, if you, it's, I always, the way I always explain it is if you have those actions that you know, no matter what, if someone does this, I'm going to call them. A, you can report off of that aside from lead scoring. Um, but you can also kind of set that score to automatically jump them into whatever that next bucket is that you would want them to get to. And then where lead scoring becomes really powerful is for the everything else. Like the person who is not going to raise their hand and fill out a demo request form, but they're going to come back to your website again and again and again, and they're going to go back and look at that email again and again and again, but they're never going to overtly raise their hand. Those are the people that lead scoring is really valuable for um, because they're just as qualified. They're just not waving it in your face. Gotcha, gotcha. Makes sense. Great. The couple more questions. Uh, can can this be set up to continue tracking behavior for people who already convert? I guess maybe talking about bidirectional uh, integration. Yeah, so um, you would still continue to see any engagements that they have with um, activities that are tracked in sales fusion. So like web activity, if marketing is continuing to send to them. So one thing we've seen people be really successful with is having marketing engage deeper into the sales cycle. Um, so we talked about at the beginning that handoff, um, not having marketing stop at that handoff. Um, so like they would continue to receive nurture campaigns, continue on um, deeper into that sales cycle, even once they're engaged with um, a sales rep. And so um, we're able to see um, those activities just that would carry on into CRM. Um, we will sync down opportunities. Um, so uh, if, if something gets created there or changed there, um, and then even changing fields on the leader contact, you would see that sink back down as well. Um, so yeah, you can definitely um, say that. Again, you wanna have everyone on the same page as to what changes are gonna happen and what things should be watching out for. That's great. Kind of the, the question before that, and then the question we just went to, there's kind of another one uh, that, that I actually wanna answer. It said, you know, will sugar kind of automatically move leads you know, through these stages and I think, uh, or the process. And I think what's great about, when you think about the continued information of the tracking and the and the bi-directional integration, our workflow inside Sugar, the Sugar VPN, can then, you know, because it was saying, can it automatically move that? Now, now, automatically is, you know, you, you by the time you're in Sugar, you probably want someone aware that that's a lead in your system and there's going to be some quote unquote human interaction. But what we can do together with the combined solution is, that information might further qualify somebody, right? Or 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 make them higher up your your lead queue. So so you can leverage workflow and and other kind of intuitive capabilities inside the UX of Sugar and the, the functionalities to not necessarily automate that because by the time you're 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 qualified and all the things that you're tracking in Sales Fusion in Sugar, you, you got a human that's going to do that. But you but you can also kind of prioritize and push those through the stages. So so you're still tracking that. Okay, now one more is the uh, one more question was if we're utilizing Sugar CRM, 
will the sales fusion piece automatically be included or is it something we have to add ourselves? Uh, so it would be an add-on. Um, so uh, I think as we become more in integrated into the sugar fold, um, I don't know what that will eventually look like one day, but currently um, we are a standalone platform that integrates in with sugar. So um, as um, kind of part of the acquisition, prior to the acquisition, I should say, um, and becoming part of Sugar, we um, have integrations to seven different leading CRMs, Sugar being one of them. Um, and we are going to continue to service our other integrations. Um, so you could use Sales Fusion standalone with a different CRM. You could use it integrated in with Sugar. Um, so, yeah, I think, did I answer that question? Yeah, I think so. And again, if yeah, I mean, adding it yourself, you can talk to your rep. Uh, if you've got a sugar account manager, just uh, just go talk to them. And it, the the great thing is that the integration exists today. It's existed for years, as as Jen is kind of talking about. So so if you want it tomorrow, you could start getting it tomorrow. That's the great thing is is that it's already integrated, and and that's one of the reasons why it makes such a perfect uh, and great merger for the two companies. Uh, a final question, uh, kind of talking about these combined. Can the combined data be used for reports in sugar? Uh, Jenna, I, I can take this one if you're not uh, fully no, on that one. No, this is right? my favorite one. Um, <laughs> yes, it can. So um, we will push back marketing data natively into Sugar. And, and you have some choices around that. You can kind of decide what you want to push back and what you don't. Um, but things we can push are things like their delivery status. Um, obviously, we'd update their unsubscribe if they were to, to do that. And then things like email opens and clicks, form submissions, so like what they actually submitted on the form, we can push that back. Um, web activity, uh, we have an events module that integrates with either GoToWebinar or WebEx, so you can um, push that event attendee information back in as well. And then once that exists in Sugar, you have that there to report off of. So you can combine that with information in Sugar that we may not think, um, because as part of the integration, we'll think contacts, leads, accounts, and opportunities, and then all of your custom fields um, associated with those objects. But we're not going to think, you know, custom products, tables, and things like that that are kind of outside of our, our purview for marketing. But once we push that marketing data back in, you can combine that on the sugar side, which is really cool. Yes, and, and we're actually working on some really, really cool things that's going to take this combined data and give you all kinds of time series, potential attribution, all things that I don't think anybody does in the market today. So really exciting things coming now that we've got the combined full closed loop of the aligned pipeline, really cool stuff. And that's all our questions. So if you're already using Sugar, if you're not using Sugar yet, if you're already using Sales Fusion, curious about Sugar, if you're using Jesus, you can learn more. Uh, if, if, you, if you haven't started uh, with Sugar yet, you can, you can grab that URL. We'll keep that up for a moment here and take a trial. Now also, one of the things we're doing, especially for our existing uh, sugar users who might be on this webinar, uh, or even if you're interested in, in how these combined solutions work and you're not using either, uh, if you look at that little bit.ly link there, I've, I've shortened it, there's another webinar that we're going to be doing uh, almost on a weekly basis. So if you, if you register, it'll give you the, uh, the options on when you want to actually show up. And we'll be doing live demos of the combined solution and how they work together. And really the benefits of these, you'll see all the things we talked about here in action. So it's really, really cool. So if you want to see more, absolutely uh, sign up for those. Now, that's all the time we have today. I want to thank you guys again. We'll be sending out a replay of this in an archive, and, and you'll be able to look through all the slides again through the replay. So you'll have all that. I know there were a couple questions uh, about that in the queue there. So with that, Jenna, thank you. Awesome stuff. Great stuff. And everyone? We'll see you next time in the CRM Blueprint series. Awesome. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye. Bye.